I'm Janice Edwards. Coming up on Bay Area Vista, we're talking with director Shira Piven about Welcome to Me, a movie starring Kristen Wiig, a hilarious movie that you must check out. And then we're talking with Ali D'Souza about Broken Heroes, his film about veterans and their plight. He's also an author. We'll talk with him about that. And Tyus Resende joins us from BizWorld. BizWorld helps young students learn the secrets of entrepreneurship and leadership. That's all coming up next on Janice Edwards Bay Area Vista. Join us. Welcome to Bay Area Vista. I'm Janice Edwards. Thank you so much for joining us. On our show today, we begin talking with director Shira Piven. Her latest movie is Welcome to Me, starring Kristen Wiig. It's a poignant and hilarious story. Then Ali D'Souza talks about broken heroes, veterans who are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder after returning home. And Tyus Resende from BizWorld shares how students are learning the keys for leadership and successful businesses. But first today, we begin with director Shira Piven. The movie Welcome to Me starts Kristen Wiig as someone with borderline personality disorder who stops taking her meds, wins the lotto, and decides that she wants to be the next Oprah. Everybody, comes to our beautiful planet Earth, Earth to, to do, do something, something great, great something, something unique, something that only you were born to do. 14, there's 57, 15, and 54, and 39. Thanks for calling the California Lottery. If you're calling to report a winning, just say, I'm a winner at any time. I'm a winner at any time. I was born in the year 1971 in Simi Valley, California. And I've been using masturbation as a sedative since 1991. Now, I'd like to get a volunteer from the audience. What's your name? My name is Alice Klieg. I won $86 million. Think she really won the lottery? Seriously, can someone Google that? You must be the big winner. Hi, I'm Rich. Me too. I want a talk show with me as the host. You want to talk about current events? No. And what kind of stuff do you want to talk about? Me. Ooh. How much will that cost? $15 million. Oh, and I want to come in on a swan boat. Shira, thank you so much for giving us time to talk with You're you today. Welcome. This is an incredible movie. How did you wind up deciding that this was going to be a project to which you would devote so much time? Um, Elliot Lawrence, who wrote the screenplay, he and I have worked together, had worked together for many years, but not um, not as filmmakers. And a mutual friend of ours said, you've got to read the screenplay that Elliot wrote. And I fell in love with it in a way that I don't remember ever, ever feeling this way quite about a script. It, mm -hmm. it seemed to already have a life. It seemed to already, these characters seemed to be walking around <laughs> somehow <laughs> for me. So I had this kind of mission to get the movie made. Mm -hmm. And Elliot I actually originally wrote it as a pilot for series and um, or so he says I because see that. when yeah. I read it I really felt like you know it was the idea would be like an HBO or right. um, uh, you know um, a cable TV kind of series in in the vein of Breaking Bad etc right. Nurse Betty but I really when I read it it seemed like a screenplay to me mm -hmm. It just felt like a movie, and I suggested that he do a couple of rewrites, and maybe we try to get it made. And I thought I'm giving him terrible advice, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's selfish because I really, I really want to direct this movie. And um, but it turned out kind of better than we could have ever imagined. Yes, it is an incredible movie, and it's already received high praise. And deciding to cast Kristen Wiig, was, of course, was brilliant because. 
it's hard to imagine anyone else in that she's she's hilarious and poignant and has just a way of communicating both of those in the the brokenness and and that sense of justification of whatever the reality is and so for this character alice 86 million dollar alice it's perfect in that way like oprah but with a swan boat talk show mm -hmm. hosted by me hosted by you yeah all right well how about a little recap um in case you missed Last week's episode of the Alice Clegg Show. That's here's not what, what it's called. Going on. It's not the name of it. You're off your meds. You just spent fifteen million dollars. You're living in a reservation casino, and you're hosting your own talk show. I thought I asked you not to eat. It's a banana. It's in its own container. She's heartbreaking. And there's a sense that she's kind of a lonely, she represents in some ways uh, lonely and forgotten people who are sitting around watching their TVs yes. and, um, you know, playing the lottery every day. And I think everybody can identify with that feeling of just wanting to be able to have whatever your dream is and yeah. say, okay, I'll write a check for it and make it, make it happen. There it is. Okay. And then at the same time, too, because, because of the era of Oprah and on most talk shows, we're accustomed to that stripping away of the filter and that nakedness because people demand to know you, especially now with social media. So she's doing that, but in that way that's too much. It's like that fine line of... I want to know you, but not that real you. <laughs> you know, she, she I love the way you're talking about it. It's I totally agree. Yeah, stripping away the filters, and we don't. Yeah, we. It's there's always this. You know, it's the stupid phrase, too much information, mm -hmm. but it's it's a particular kind of too much information. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There was like, like a scene that we that didn't make it into this that was in an earlier cut of the screenplay where she just literally just like was on the air in one of her one of her shows just looking in the mirror in her underwear just like lifting her boob and letting it drop <laughs> and lifting it and letting it drop and i was like oh we should have found a way to keep that, that in the final there. but here oh, we yeah, yeah i right. substituted oh uh we have something where uh, a scene where she just is like dancing the way that people dance kind of in alone in their right. apartment yes. and she dances kind of in yes. at the opening of one of her shows right i know and that's the thing too because it's shocking that way or even when she says i found a pubic hair in the shape of a question mark on my pillow this morning so, and what do you say to that but okay yeah, <laughs> so. she just starts right. her very first show right and she has no self-consciousness about it and this is just how yeah right and because she's mentally, she, you know, she's dealing with a mental illness, borderline personality disorder, which, which tends to manifest in a lack of empathy for others or struggle to be empathetic and yes. struggle with impulse control. Um, we get to sort of see ourselves in her in a more exaggerated way right. because I feel like we're all, you know, this culture of reality TV, like we, we see yes. Snooki from Jersey Shores or the woman on Dance Moms who I think had, you know, it was heartbreaking that no one seemed to notice that she was having like kind of a nervous breakdown right. this last season on the, my daughter watches the show. And that reminded yeah. me of Alice. And Alice is there to kind of, you know, I think this movie reflects a lot of those stranger moments that we don't, how do we deal with this, yes. watching this stuff and integrating it and then our own desires to be, you know, should we all have our ta own talk show? Right. Am I, I supposed so, to want right? that? <laughs> okay. I would vote for that. I certainly, <laughs> I'm terribly biased in that regard. I've got two. <laughs> but you know, the other thing that you bring up too, which is the delicate dance, is she does have borderline personality disorder. And then when it comes to really empowering and at the same time treating people and protecting people, with mental illness, that's a struggle that loved ones, relatives go through. I mean, it, it, it's part of the plot. She stops taking her meds, and then, but we show how her therapist then refuses to see her at one point um, because she's because of what she does. And so, so that's something that I guess to use Oprah language is a teachable moment in a way. But what do you hope people will take away regarding that particular issue? And welcome to me. 
Yeah, I like that you. I like that you're quoting Oprah. <laughs> Something Alice would do. Right. Yeah. Um, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Now. <laughs> <laughs> no swans um, here. <laughs> <laughs> no swans. Um, yeah, I feel really strongly that. Well, a couple of things. I think that the diagnosis doesn't define the person, and I think that we still it's easy to stigmatize mental illness. And I feel like we, you know, Oprah's gone a long way into. Go, gone a long way towards making mental illness uh, a subject that we can all talk about. Yes. And I feel like the more we can do that, the better. Um, but, uh, my main editor who worked on the film, he, he just did a documentary called Walking Man, which is about a father with, um, with uh, bipolar mm -hmm. and his son actually as well. And they do a walk kind of to raise awareness about mental illness. Mm -hmm. and. Um, what I love about what I love about his film is that it brings awareness and it brings an openness and he goes and talks about about it in schools and he gets it's it's televised and he does a walk mm -hmm. and with with Alice our film isn't about mental illness per se it's really to me about how mental illness collides with a kind of a, our social illness yes. in a way mm -hmm. but we really wanted to treat Alice with compassion and as as much as we laugh in the movie we never for a moment are laughing at her right and, ho and I think ultimately we have compassion for her. Yes, absolutely. And Nami also does a, a lot of walks throughout the area, just mentioning that in terms of for mental illness and bringing awareness there. But I agree with you with Alice that we laugh with her and then mm -hmm. we, we salute her courage too because a lot of times when she says to someone, there's nothing wrong with you and if you want to wear a two-piece and you're not the perfect size, wear it. And yeah. that's something empowering that really, it's, it's a liberating message and I, especially with you being in mm -hmm. Hollywood and everything that you experience, you know how important that is. Is. So that must be very gratifying to have this as part of your work. Yes, yeah. and I love that you picked up on that because that's not, that's, I feel like you pinpointed something. It, I, I always feel like Alice, as much as she's, her life is a cautionary tale and it reflects our own kind of a lot of messed up things in our culture, I also think that she's inspiring because she has no guile, she has no filters, and there is something inspiring about the fact that she's like yes i'm getting i'm getting out there i'm putting myself out there right. why don't you do why don't you do the same well it's such a pleasure to talk with you before we go i know that your brother is jeremy piven so i'm just curious at yeah. home what was family life like for the two of you growing up um my parents were uh my parents were actors and and teacher directors as well and Life, they really wanted us to grow up in a, you know, a really kind of fairly normal family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were, my brother, <laughs> the family story is that my brother, when he was about seven, didn't know what my parents did for a living. And my mom had a lot of shoes in her closet, and he thought that maybe they sold shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> but we did, as we got older, we, we both kind of ended up studying at their theater, and we both kind of came to acting uh, kind of the long way around, um, kind of on, came to it on our own. But we, you know, a lot of late night discussions about plays, a lot of, a lot of collaboration in our family. My mom's in the movie. She plays Alice's mom. Okay, yes. And I've direct, I directed right. my dad in a production of King Lear. My brother and oh, I are working incredible. on something that hopefully Hopefully, I'm writing, co-writing a screenplay with a partner that uh, hopefully Jeremy will, will star in that he's producing. How fun. Yeah. Oh, that's great. A great family affair. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks you so too. much for Thank the time. Thank you. And we should mention Will Farrell is one of the producers of this as well. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll share. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Thais Resende is the CEO of BizWorld, and we are at BizWorld locations to find out more about this organization that focuses on entrepreneur and leadership skills. Thais, welcome. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> and tell me a little bit about BizWorld for people who don't know. Of course. So BizWorld is an organization that started almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago plus. And we were um, founded by Tim Draper here in the Silicon Valley. And our mission is to challenge and engage children in elementary and middle school with our entrepreneurial programs that teaches them about financial uh, responsibility, leadership, teamwork, but also teaches them um, about career exploration and uh, how to be better citizens. 
It's incredible to look at what has changed because the model for so many years was just make sure you get your education and get a job. And then as the economy became less reliable in certain ways, then there's been more of a focus on becoming your own boss and making sure that those principles are learned as well. What do you consider the most important things for students to understand that many adults don't understand before they start a business? Well, what we realize today um, in every job that you go in America and even in the world is that entrepreneurship is more than just starting a business. You can have an entrepreneurial mindset, which makes you really a key player in any pathway or work that you have. And really, that's where we are focusing. Um, so what does that mean? Entrepreneurial mindset means that you are a self-starter, that you can be a leader, but also a follower, that you can work as a team, that you have great communication skills, that you have initiative, that you are using at all times critical thinking and you are a problem solver. And who doesn't like to have that type of a team player in, <laughs> right, in exactly. your group, right? And really when you talk to bigger corporations, what they're looking is not only somebody that has a bachelor's degree or a science degree in, in a specific field, um, of course they want that, but they also want to have these other skills so that they can benefit the company at the larger scale. And really that's what we're trying to teach. We know that not every kid that comes through this world will be an entrepreneur, though we're hoping that many of them will be innovative and will be the next big thing in the Silicon Valley or in the world. But what we really want to make sure is that these kids learn what is important. Um, like the, the skills that I just mentioned, so that they can really find a good feed wherever they go. Yes, that's very important. For your particular career track, you came yes. to the U.S. from Mexico. You've always been involved with nonprofits that, are, that have that entrepreneurial focus. Why has that attracted you? I really believe in entrepreneurship. For me, um, I have learned um, in my 15 years of experience with entrepreneurship training that it really is a poverty alleviation tool. Um, nowadays, we, we hear day in and day out that the gap between the wealthy and the not so wealthy <laughs> um, is, is growing. We are hearing everyday news about how the middle class is disappearing. And the reality of it is that the bigger this gap um, go, grows, the worse it's going to be for um, most of us in, in the country in terms of employability. Yeah. So entrepreneurship really gives a tool to many people that may not find a job to create their own and not only create a job that will benefit themselves, but also will create jobs for others in their community that are also finding a struggle to find that job. So when you are working with students and you teach in the classroom, what do you find are the biggest challenges that they have with really adopting that leadership vision and entrepreneurial mindset? There's two things that happen in the classroom. Um, so we are focusing on children in elementary and middle school, as I said, but um, because we are at every level with every background that you can imagine, um, we're able to compare what happens when you are in an affluent um, school district compared to when you go to a low income, uh, undeserved kind of area. So the biggest challenge that you find there is that um, in low income communities, uh, financial topics are not something that they're used to, to talk about at the dinner table or even at school. Usually mo money becomes like a taboo. It's something that they are scared to talk about and when they hear about money and money management, it's all about scarcity. And um, when you go to an affluent school, it's completely different, right? So yes. what we are seeing our role uh, when we go to every um, background in our nation is that we're leveling the play field. We're making sure every child has the opportunity to understand how to manage finances, how to do a budget, how to keep track of, of their expenses and their income, and understand what a profit means. Most people, even adults, will have a hard time understanding what's the difference between revenue and profit. Yes. When you go with children, what we're trying to do is give them that financial literacy that they will need that will be so helpful as they grow up and they manage five dollars or five million dollars you know you need to know how to manage that money so that it's beneficial to you and your family otherwise it doesn't matter matter how much money you have you'll always have problems right it's like you say 
Secrets of a Millionaire Mind, that the changing the mindset exactly. is so important. And, and your level of what you're accustomed to, the amount of money you're accustomed to having. Because even if someone gets $5 million, and you see this a lot of times with lottery yeah. winners, then many times it dissipates because the ability to contain and have savings hasn't been instilled as Correct. Well. How to use your money is so critical that it doesn't matter how much money you have. You need to learn to do that. And in low-income communities, what we find is that that topic is not addressed. So they really kids struggle to do that. So the other thing that we do is we give them an opportunity to do career exploration. So part of what the program does is um, one classroom will be divided in smaller groups and each group will become a company. Within this company, you would have leadership roles. You, have, you will have a CEO, a VP of finance, a VP of marketing, a VP of manufacturing, wow. and different roles like this. And as we're going through the program, each kid gets an opportunity to lead that specific segment of the building of this company. Um, so everyone gets an opportunity to, to check what leadership is all about. And we Excellent. know that it's not about giving orders, but right. really getting everyone to work together yes. and doing it for the bigger vision. And the other thing that happens is that children are applying for these roles as you would apply for a job. So kids l l um, read a job description, they self-assess what they believe are their strengths, and based on that they apply for that job. Giving an opportunity for children that have been, say, labeled like the distractor in the class because they cannot stop talking to suddenly be the VP of sales. They're <laughs> That's great. great and awesome at that. Right. And the shy kid that is super good at math can be the VP of finance. So everyone understands then that their, their skill sets, the, the strengths that they have, can really be put to use for a future vision of where they can go in life. Well, Thais, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us in today and continued success with what you're doing. Thank, Thank you so much, Danny. Oh, oh, you're welcome. Okay. And if you'd like to contact BizWorld and find out more about it, the details are on our screen. Ali D'Souza is a renaissance man, an actor, an author, a filmmaker, and we're excited to have him with us today as he talks about his upcoming work, Broken Heroes. <laughs> Major Andrade, have you been home? Thank you so much for joining us. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the genesis and the whole vision for Broken Heroes. Oh, so right to Broken Heroes. I'm glad you asked because it is my passion project. Yeah. I actually began writing Broken Heroes in 2008, 2009, kind of the transition of the year. And I didn't know that I was going to do that. I started on a small short film project. But then I looked at my own life and saw who was most influential. And it's in the book, Atlanta Crossing and the Acknowledgement. Yes. The three most influential men of my life I said, wow, they were all veterans, mm -hmm. you know? One was a captain in the, uh, in the army back when the Korean War time, where African-American men certainly didn't raise that rank. Yes. Uh, the other was, he raised the rank, of, he was in the army too, I can forget his rank, but an mm -hmm. uncle, and he uh, fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And then my biological father, who became my best friend, mm -hmm. I fortunately was to get reunited with him, and he was an Air Force 
uh, security police and also had a security company once he left the military. Plus, he had a lot to do with the independence of Cape Verde Islands yes. in the revolution. So I was influenced by men who I say put God, family, and country first. And I'm still trying to catch up to them and try to emulate that. But the situation with the veterans is that we have people and war is a terrible thing. I don't like to take the political side of it at all. But right now, in the United States of America, we have an epidemic, and I think it's not talked about enough. Um, the, according to the National Affairs Center on Post-Traumatic post Stress Syndrome, I get tongue-tied on that one. <laughs> right. uh, PTSD it's a mouthful, is better. PTSD, this PTSD, we know PTSD it's works, so that's right. why we have an acronym, Exactly, right? exactly. So they report, and these are the government's own statistics, that every month 1,000 veterans attempt suicide. Every 65 minutes, one succeeds. This means that we have 22 suicides every single day of soldiers, men and women, who sacrifice the most and they come back to a battle that they don't win here. So that sum total means that since 2001, including Iraq and Afghanistan, we've had more of our soldiers die here in the U.S. of A. than ever died abroad. And it's, it's not tragic. talked about. It's not, the public, I think, is not aware enough about that. Right. Certainly, we've become more aware. And sometimes it's tragically because someone's in the news when there's right. been a killing and then PTSD was part of that. And now veterans administrations are being looked at the hospitals in terms of how are they really serving right. our vets. And you mentioned Atlantic Crossing, which is your book that talks about this as well. We're doing a crowdfunding campaign, yes. so that it's going to be a people's movie. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful people jumping on board, and I think we're going to be successful. You have Ali's Angels, and that's your nonprofit. Yes, and right now it's it's a nonprofit that I, was used to be focused on battered women and families because it's something close to me, part of my personal experience, and so. When you say part of your personal experience, what do you mean? Well, I grew up, uh, I know, this is probably the first interview I disclosed so much personal information about my personal life, but I guess I've become comfortable with that. I was born in the mid-50s, so yes, I'll be 60 years old next week. Wow. So all my IMDB profiles fib and say I'm 40s because I, I play pretty much 38 to 40 every time I get cast. <laughs> but actually, the truth is, I'm a granddad. You well, know, congratulations, and, and you look I'll great. Be, I'm sort of, uh, just give me a moment. Of course. So... Being in the foster care system in the 50s, being the, um, the birth product of two immigrant teenagers, my mother was very abusive, God rest her soul. Uh, she died pretty young, but I also, having during those visits, witnessed her being battered. Now, my mother was very tall, 5'10", handsome, beautiful, would be a supermodel by any account, but being in those experiences, a little boy looking out a keyhole and watching the man smash your mother down. So as you learn, her behavior was something that she probably experienced throughout her life. And so coming to terms of how to deal with those kinds of things, you know, yes. makes you grow as a human being, but it wasn't always easy. But again, I learned to finally call my mother mom on her deathbed for the first time. I just want to thank you for sharing all that you do, all of your gifts in the world, and also sharing what you just did. We really appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. We would like to tell you that if you'd like to contact Ali D'Souza, details are on our screen. And that's our show. I'm Janice Edwards. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for all that you do to make our Bay Area, our Sacramento area, and our world a better place. Please join us again next time. We look forward to seeing you then.